When it comes to maths, most people either love it or they hate it, but for those that love it, the concept of maths as a recreational hobby rather than an academic pursuit dates back thousands of years, at least to the ancient Egyptians. What makes maths particularly interesting as a hobby compared to various sciences is how low the barrier of entry is. That's not to say that maths is necessarily easy, but it doesn't require laboratories full of expensive, specialized equipment. All a person needs to make their next big discovery in maths is their imagination, and ideally something to write on and probably an enormous brain. As such, it's no surprise that history is full of incredible mathematical discoveries made by amateurs. Today we're going to take a look at some of these discoveries and the people who made them, or at least the people who didn't choose to remain anonymous. It began as all great discoveries in maths do, with a discussion about anime on 4chan. First airing in 2006, the anime The Melancholy of Haru Suzumiya was a show heavily featuring time travel. Because the story uh, was about time travel, when the manga was adapted into an anime, they decided to air the episodes in chronological order. It was later rebroadcast in a different order and was then released on DVD in a third order. This got fans of the show wondering, since the episodes could be watched in any order, what is the fewest number of episodes a person would need to watch to have seen all 14 episodes in every order possible? Since there are 14 episodes, that means there are 14 factorial different permutations these episodes could appear in. That comes out to over 87 billion. If we multiply each permutation by its 14 episode length, we get over 1.2 trillion episodes. But people knew there was a better answer than that thanks to super permutations. Let's say you have two objects, A and B. There are two different permutations of those objects, A and B, and B and A. However, if we were to create a sequence of A, B, A, that single sequence contains all possible permutations of A and B. B. If we were to add a third object, C, there would be six possible permutations. All six of these can be found in a super permutation that is only nine characters long, ABC, ABA, CBA. These super permutations can be worked out by hand when the number of objects is really low, but by the time you get to five objects, it already starts getting seriously unwieldy. And how would you solve this for the general case of N objects? Fans of Haruhi didn't realize it, but they were actually trying to solve a math problem that professional mathematicians have been working on for decades. And on September the 16th, 2011, an anonymous 4chan user posted a proof. Rather than trying to solve the problem specifically for the 14 episodes of Aruhi, this user found a general solution for the lower bounds of any super permutation. They posted their proof on 4chan, where it largely went unnoticed. It wasn't until seven years later that a professional mathematician found the 4chan user's proof to the Aruhi problem on a math and science fandom wiki. They checked the user's work, and indeed everything they'd done was correct. Despite having eluded others for decades, a proof for the lower bounds had been discovered. Some mathematicians who were currently researching super permutations published the paper, a lower bounds on the length of the shortest super pattern, with anonymous 4chan poster listed as the lead author. Essentially, their paper was just the 4chan post translated into more formal language and notation. The story doesn't end there, though. Once this story blew up, it got others thinking about super permutations. Among them was science fiction author Greg Egan, who came up with a proof for the upper bound of these super permutations. For anyone familiar with how this works, the 4chan user proved that the shortest super permutation of n objects can't be shorter than the number given by his equation, but it might be longer. Author Greg Egan proved that the shortest one couldn't be longer than the number given by his equation, but it might be shorter. The goal is to get the upper and lower bounds closer and closer together until they finally meet, giving a definitive answer, and Egan's new upper bound was dramatically lower than the previously known upper bound. This wasn't Egan's first foray as an amateur mathematician either. He had co-authored two papers in 2002, and in 2014 he published what became known as Egan's Conjecture, which related to spheres and higher dimensional geometry that we simply don't need to get into here because our brains are too small. There is some debate as to whether or not Srinivasa Ramajan should be considered an amateur mathematician. Born in India in 1887, it was clear from a young age that Ramajan was a maths prodigy. He excelled in all subjects in school, but maths was his clear passion. By the time he was 11, he was reading advanced books on maths designed for students in their final year of undergraduate studies. He reportedly understood these books completely and began developing his own theorems. After graduating high school, Ramanujan was awarded a scholarship to Government Arts College in Kumbakonam. However, 
However, he only cared about math, so he failed his other subjects, causing him to lose his scholarship. After failing out, he ran away from home and enrolled at a college in Madras. Once again, he only cared about his maths courses, but he struggled to pass those as well since he only bothered to answer test questions that he found interesting. Again, Ramajan failed out of college, and for a period of time he lived in extreme poverty. He continued his work in maths while also attempting to find any sort of clerical or accounting work that he could. Despite attempting to go to college twice, nearly everything Ramanjan knew had been self-taught. He had devoured the most advanced materials available at a young age and worked in isolation. This lack of formal education in maths is why many consider Ramanjan to be an amateur. Unfortunately, this means that, like many amateurs, Ramanjan wasn't good at formally proving his ideas. He filled notebooks with theorems and equations largely based on his own intuition. This became a problem when he tried to get the attention of Indian mathematicians. Ramanujan would send letters to people containing his work, but to no avail. Though it was clear that his work was impressive, the lack of his ability to prove his equations led many to believe that the work wasn't truly his own. And even if they did believe it was his work, there was a good chance that they wouldn't understand it anyway because it was just so advanced. Over the course of several years, he eventually began making a name for himself in Indian mathematics circles, and once they were able to recognize his brilliance, they became extremely supportive of his work. Some of them sent Ramanujan's work to British mathematicians in London, but it did not go as expected. They essentially rejected Ramanujan for being too much of an amateur, stating that his work was full of holes and that he lacked the formal education needed for anybody to take him seriously. Ramanujan then personally sent letters with his work to a few professors at Cambridge. Two returned his work with no reply, but he had caught the eye of GM Hardy. Hardy wanted Ramanujan to come to Cambridge, but Ramanujan was hesitant to abandon his family and travel to a foreign land. After a few years of correspondence with Hardy, he eventually made the trip to Cambridge, but Ramanujan and Hardy's working relationship was as complicated as it was short. After only a few years in England, Ramanujan had to return to India. He had suffered from health problems for his entire life, and Ramanujan died when he was only 32. Despite dying so young and having no formal training in maths, to the point that many of the top mathematicians of the day wouldn't even look at his work, Ramanujan left behind notebooks filled with over 4,000 different theorems. A few of them turned out to be incorrect, and because of his lack of formal education, some of Ramanujan's theorems were things he was unaware other mathematicians had already proven. But the vast majority of his work was novel and accurate, and he even provided solutions to questions in maths that were not only unsolved, but were considered unsolvable at the time. His contemporaries often struggled to understand what his work even meant, let alone how he could have come up with the ideas for his theorems. Because of the volume of his work, it's impossible to point to a single discovery made by Ramanujan as being the most important. What we can say is that his understanding of maths was so far ahead of its time that his notebooks have kept mathematicians busy for the past century. Though most of his theorems have now been proven, many still remain unsolved as professional mathematicians attempt to catch up to the level of understanding the self-taught genius possessed over a hundred years ago. Tilling the plane, or tessellation, has been of interest to mathematicians, artists, and sculptors for thousands of years. Tessellation is the process of covering a plane with one or more geometric shapes like a mosaic. Of particular interest to geometers are monohedral tessellations, in which an infinite plane can be completely covered with no gaps or overlap using tiles that are all of a single size and shape. Some of these are readily easy to find. For example, every triangle and rectangle can tile the plane seamlessly. However, things get interesting when you try the same thing with pentagons. Many might expect that this would be easiest with a regular polygon, where the angles are all the same size and the sides are all the same length. But because the 108 degree angle of a regular pentagon does not quite divide evenly into 360 degrees, this is actually impossible. There is no way to tile the plane using regular pentagons without either leaving gaps or overlapping the tiles. This led to the question of how you could design a pentagonal tile that would form a tessellation, with the first such shape being identified in 1918 by Karl Reinhardt. He went on to find four more pentagons antagonal tiles, with Richard Kirshner finding three more in 1968. When Kirshner published his findings, he decided that the eight pentagons discovered were a comprehensive list of all pentagons that could tile the plane. Fast forward eight years, and a 52-year-old homemaker and mother of five from San Diego, Marjorie Rice, rushed to a mailbox to get the latest issue of Scientific American. Rice was a huge fan of the column Mathematical Games by Martin Gardner, and she enjoyed reading his articles every month. In the July issue, Gardner wrote about tiling the plane with various polygons, and in it, he mentioned Kirshner's claim that all pentagonal tiles had been discovered. However, when the December issue was published, Garner revealed that a reader had submitted a then-unknown ninth pentagonal tile. 
Inspired by this new revelation, Rice decided to experiment with the problem herself. She created her own system of notation to work through the possible relationships between the angles and the lengths of the sides, and spent the holiday season drawing diagrams at the kitchen table. Within just two months, Rice discovered a new pentagon as well as 58 dihedral tessellations that each used two pentagons. She mailed her work to Gardner, who in turn shared it with Doris Schatzschneider, an expert in tessellation. As is common when examining work from amateurs, it took Schatzschneider a while to figure out what the hell Rice's notation actually meant. She was eventually able to validate the results, but Rice wasn't done yet. By the end of 1977, Rice had discovered a few more new monohedral pentagon tilings. With a total of four new tiles discovered, Rice had now found more tiles than Kirshner did back when he claimed that there were no more left to find. Though her discoveries weren't published in Gardner's Scientific American column, only being published as an addendum in a 1988 compilation of his articles, Rice still received considerable recognition for her discoveries. In 1999, the Mathematical Association of America even used one of Rice's pentagons to tile the foyer of their headquarters in Washington, D.C. Born in southern France in 1607, Pierre de Fermat was referred to as the Prince of Amateurs by famed mathematician E.T. Bell. Fermat's contributions to mathematics are so numerable that many even argued he should count as a professional. But despite how prolific Fermat's work was, he really was just a hobbyist. Fermat earned his law degree from the University of Orléans in 1623, and he spent the remainder of his life working as a lawyer and a magistrate. In his free time, he loved to study maths, and he would send letters to his friends and associates detailing his work. Through these letters, he made major contributions to number theory, probability, and analytic geometry. Some of his work even laid the foundation for Newton and Leibniz to discover calculus. However, there are two theorems for which Fermat is most known, Fermat's Little Theorem and Fermat's Last Theorem. But today, let's talk about Fermat's Last Theorem. The theorem is reminiscent of Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and it looks something like this. What Fermat was saying was that there are no integer solutions to Pythagoras' formula if n is greater than 2. This was something that mathematicians had mulled over for thousands of years and were pretty sure was true, but nobody had ever been able to prove it, so they never wrote it down as fact. Of course, Fermat didn't actually prove this either, or at the very least, if he did, he never bothered to write it down. This was a common trend in his career, as his letters frequently included advanced discoveries in maths with no proof whatsoever. Indeed, the Little Theorem wasn't proven until nearly a hundred years after his death, when Leonhard Euler became the first to create a successful proof. In the letter in which Fermat presented his Little Theorem, he wrote, I would send you a demonstration of it if I did not fear going on too long. Similarly, Fermat's last theorem was written inside the margin of his personal copy of Diophantus of Alexandria's Arithmetica. Fermat wrote his theorem, claiming that he had a proof, but that it was too big to fit in the margin. This was a running theme in his work, and perhaps if Fermat had a little more time and some more paper, he could have solved all of the great mysteries of the universe. Unsurprisingly, many mathematicians believe that Fermat never actually had proof for these things. It took over 300 years before anybody could solve the last theorem, and it involved advanced branches of maths that simply didn't exist at the time. Still, his instincts appear to always be spot on, because whether he could prove it or not, the ideas Fermat came up with inevitably turned out to be true. And because of his notoriety and the confidence with which he claimed to have proof, the belief that a proof of Fermat's last theorem must surely be over the horizon led to many important advancements in number theory as people tried to find the answer. 